and welcome to our program where each week we'll bring you a series of interviews with people educating and inspiring in the hot topics of health, wellbeing and lifestyle. For our first guest today we have Trudy Pavlovsky, the Queen of Shadow Values, who will be talking to us today about embracing our shadow values. Welcome Trudy. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here today, Linda. What are shadow values for our viewers out there? Viewers might be able to identify general normal values. So the traditional values of trust and love and respect, those nice values that you're totally happy to share with the world because they feel good. I work with the values on the flip side, which are the shadow values. So these are values that growing up, something's happened, we've been taught to be ashamed of wanting this value and I illuminate those values. We bring them into the light because when you harness the power of the shadow values, what happens, you use these values to motivate you with your goals and your life just can take off in ways that never before thought possible. Mm. So there's 10 and today obviously we don't have time to go through 10 of them. So I really wanted to share two of them today. So I wanted to talk about attention and validation because when I work with people with these values and they embody it and they get it, their life really does start to transform. So I'll talk to you about attention first because here we are on TV, like center of attention. So we've embodied this value, right? We feel good about getting attention. But I wanna ask the viewers, how many of you out there secretly crave attention to be seen, to be recognized, but you don't take the action to go out and do it? Especially if you're in business or you're wanting to change your life somehow, get a promotion, receiving attention when it feels good allows you to get what you really want. And then with validation, this is a really interesting one because quite often when we're growing up and we're like little kids, we're always looking for approval from a parent or a teacher or an older sibling. But if we don't get that approval, we feel bad and then we start looking for it further and further afield and we lose trust in our own ability to make decisions for ourselves and to be okay going after what we want. So when we learn to invalidate ourselves internally and stop asking 20 people around us if what we want to do is okay, A, we just feel better. We start taking action from a place that's so much more inspired. And if we're in business or if we're looking to create something in our life, we get the momentum because we're not constantly having a check in with somebody else. Trudy, we asked, we were talking off camera about imposter syndrome. So could you explain to our viewers something a bit more about imposter syndrome and what it is for them? Imposter syndrome, which is a person's inability to believe in their own results, no matter how much they've studied, how much effort they've put in, no matter how many times people say good job, that ties in so closely with shadow values and downplayed their results. Chances are, if you're doing that and saying that to yourself, you've got imposter syndrome. And so what happens when you start embodying your shadow values, that little imposter syndrome voice, it just gets quieter and quieter and quieter in your mind because your shadow values, when you can be comfortable with attention, can validate yourself and some of the other ones, take control of your own life, honour your own ambitions, own your own superiority, be comfortable receiving money. When you build up all of those, the imposter syndrome stops because you get comfortable being recognised for who you are. Because it goes back to our beliefs around what we, we have around who we are, how we show up, uh, what we want to create in the life and what we think is possible. And beliefs form in childhood 
and they're based purely on our experiences. So they're very unique for everyone. And when you can look at your beliefs and see how they've formed patterns growing up and how they shape your life, then you can see these are my values and they all tie together in a nice little bow. But if you want to start transforming these things, it's like have a look at where you're putting the brakes on in your life, where you're saying, I can't possibly do that, or I can't receive that, or I'm not worthy. Because when you look at those patterns and those thoughts that you have in your head, that's when you can start creating the change. And it's not something that happens overnight. It's something that you chip away at every day. <laughs> And you would start with the value of attention. And it's like, where do I not feel comfortable receive att receiving attention? And one of the ladies I worked with, she didn't feel comfortable going out in a pretty dress and wearing lipstick. So she decided one day, because she'd received negative attention in the past, she decided that she was better than the past and she wanted to reinvent the story that she was telling herself. So she got up one morning, she put on the nice dress, did her lipstick, did up her hair, and she walked down the street. And she'd made the decision when she was walking down the street to hold herself high, to smile at people, and be comfortable in that moment. So with that education that you've received in your own life about yeah. imposter syndrome, about shadow values and how all of these things play out for you, what really inspired you to look further into your own life and how that, how that existed there? Yeah. I didn't have exactly a happy life and there were times when I didn't want to be here anymore. And I got to a point in my life where I really had to make the decision how do I want to feel? How do I want to show up? How do I want to be seen in this, in this world? And what kind of legacy do I want to leave? And that took me on a journey of learning about life coaching, neurolinguistic programming, energy work. Um, I've got so many qualifications, it's ridiculous. But it, was, it started with that decision to go, I want more. I deserve more, I'm worthy of more. I gave myself permission to be the person that I always knew I was here to be. In spite of the pain and the trauma and the disappointments, I decided to look beyond that and go, I'm here for so much more. And embracing all of those values and it just changed everything. And so that's, that's why I'm here to, to share that work. And also for, as a last takeaway for the audience, what would you say to them as, as a suggestion for them to take away from today? One of the biggest lessons I learned in life was that a permission it all starts with you now I could have decided to stay miserable but I decided I wanted more so I gave myself permission and then I looked at the decisions that I was making and I decided to make different decisions and from those decisions came smart choices so for me it's permission decisions choices Thank you, Trudy. And for more information about embracing your shadow values, please go to our website. And now our next guest is Diana Jacobson, who is a wealth advisor and is here today to talk to us about unlocking the wealthy you. Welcome, Diana. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. Just discovering the wealthy us inside, what do you suggest will be, would it, people need any special tools or things okay. to go to do that? So let me explain this. The main thing we need is a magic wand. Okay, so to unlock the wealthy you, we're not just talking about finance and money and material things. We're talking about holistic wealth, that sense of well-being within us. So our health, our happiness, relationships, fun, love, laughter, our choices, you know, freedom, opportunities, doing the things that we enjoy, hanging out with the people that are fun, um, whether it's walking in nature, hobbies, art, music, all of those sorts of things that we want to do that, that make our life feel, feel great and make us feel wealthy. Because I know it sounds really cosmic, but people think that when I have money, then I'll be wealthy, but it actually works the other way around. 
And when we feel wealthy over all of those small things, when we feel abundance and prosperity with all of those small facets of our life, then we kind of magnetise and draw other things to us and we can start to build that. So I suggest if people get their magic wand and say, how would I like my life to look? Who is the wealthy me? How do I want to be? How do I want to feel? What, what does that entail? And start to have some fun with that. So the wand is to jump ahead of all the limitations. So I'm too old, I'm too young, I don't have enough money, I don't have the right education or somebody won't like it. And, and then start to build that picture so that we can create it. Could anyone do this alone? Well, look, we need a team and then we build the team around us. The same as with building a house, we have you know, carpenters and tilers and plumbers and electricians and painters and so on. We need the team of people to do the things that they're good at so that we can do the things that we're good at. So when it comes to financial and legal and business and all of those sorts of things that all of us need to take care of, households, individuals, families, business owners, we need to take responsibility for those things. So it's about building that team of those people that are our advisors and our mentors in the areas and working with them. So look at who we know about. So traditionally we know about the accountant. We know that we go to the accountant and normally that's to get our tax return done once a year. What we don't know is that perhaps we need to work with them on a more a longer term strategy, whether that's around capital gains, tax for future, whether it's GST, whatever's relevant to us. But what we need to know about the financial services regime in Australia now is that it's very narrow and accountants can only talk about tax and, and not about superannuation, for instance, or lending or legal or other things. So therefore, we do need a financial planner and people think that they only need a financial planner when they have money because that's what you do. However, we need a financial planner to look after our money. Predominantly, they look after our superannuation. So most people will have a superannuation fund from a job at some point. And there are always fees in superannuation, contrary to some of the advertising. So it's important that we make informed choices about what our super is invested in, what it's costing us. And something that a lot of people don't know is that there's insurances held in superannuation, personal insurances, things like life insurance, income protection and disability insurance. And that can be really beneficial and cost effective because a lot of families are underinsured because they don't have the cash flow, but they don't realise it can be through their super. You also need a solicitor, which historically people have had just to do their wills. They do them once, they park them there for 20 or 30 years and they don't revisit them again. They really should be looking at them a little bit more often. Have the understanding that a normal garden variety will doesn't cover a lot of the business entities. So if you've got a company or a family trust or something like that, and superannuation has its own rules. So just be mindful that the will that people set up years ago may not be relevant for their circumstances now. And also ask the question of your advisor there, your solicitor around young children. So guardianship, testamentary trusts, so that assets are not handed direct to, to minor children or to anyone under a disability or just someone that you mightn't want to hand the capital to, but they can benefit from the, the proceeds of that for their welfare. And powers of attorney is another thing that people need to have in place, but they often don't. And that's something that acts uh, while you're still alive, so someone else can make decisions for you if necessary. A lot of the time people just have their spouse make those, uh, hold that power of attorney. But if you're going to be travelling overseas or travelling in a car, chances are you'll be with your spouse, so have someone else as well. Debt is a big part. Loans brokers have debt restructured. A lot of our leakages that erode the wealthy us come through poorly managed, poorly structured debt. And there are a lot of ways that our mortgages, business loans, car loans and credit cards could be better set up, more tax effective, uh, more cost effective. So get some good advice on that. And insurance brokers similarly. So general insurances, your house, your car, your contents, your business, make sure that that's covered properly. And the big kicker with this, with this team, is to have someone that leads it. So individually, this won't be the thing for most people. They won't want to do this. They won't want to understand it and they won't want to know all the details. And nor should they. That's what those specialists are there for. But find someone in that, in that team that can lead that team and get that integrated and cohesive because where I see a lot of the leakages are all of these disparate pieces of advice but nobody gets them to meet in the middle. So there's not the cohesion in that, in that strategy and structure. 
And Diana, could you give us an example of uh, maybe a case study or someone that, that has been helped in this way? Certainly. So a phone call might, might be around uh, managing money and in that would be what are your tax entities and you know, have you done your tax returns? Have you prepared for you know, capital gains tax or something down the track? Are you in, on track with GST or whatever might be relevant there? But then there are also the things in there, superannuation, is that being looked after? Are the insurances in place? For a family that might be eligible for Centrelink, there'll be things like family tax benefit or perhaps a disability support pension or for older people, pre-retirement, so not to leave any of that planning till the last minute so that the financial planner can get things in place for any eligibility for age pension and later on for age care. Obviously in that comes estate planning as well, so that's a solicitor and making sure the wills and, and so forth are up to date and people looking to clear out their home mortgage or make sure that they're not having leakages uh, unnecessarily through that field. So there's your loans broker. And obviously we all have insurance over our properties and there's your insurance broker. So for one conversation about how can I retain more of my money, how can I make sure that my, my affairs are sorted and that I don't have to think about them and I'm going out do, you know, doing my fun stuff, um, straight away there's five different qualifications needed to have that conversation about how to plug the gaps and, and retain more of your wealth, protect your assets, minimise tax, um, maximise your cash flow and not have to think about it. What would you say that people could take away? What would you be, be your top tip for them to take away today for the viewers out there? Is not to make it too hard. Like have some fun with the magic wand with how do I want this to look? And how do I want to be as the wealthy me in all aspects of life? Find the team that you trust and can communicate with, but take the first step. When you take one step towards a goal, the universe will bring that goal one step towards you. Thank you, Diana. That's just wonderful. Um, for more information on Diana, please go to our website. Thank you. Pleasure. Welcome back. We have John here today, uh, who is a, f a remedial therapist, and he's here to take today to talk to us about corporate massage. So welcome, John. Thanks, Linda. Now, what would you what would you say are the top benefits of massage in the workplace? Uh, massage therapy for an individual is a major component of their physical well-being. So wellness and staff well-being is a really important topic these days. A lot of organisations are investing in staff wellness. So to have physical therapy at the workplace for people um, gives them the opportunity for physical change in their body, which can lead to de-stress, um, a mental refresh and a real chance to refocus going forward for the rest of the day. A lot of people, when they have access to a table massage in the workplace, um, it's generally back, soreness, shoulders, neck, um, usually go for a back, shoulders, neck sequence of massage. Um, people, uh, they get bad posture habits over a period of time, especially sitting at a desk looking at the screen all day. So puts a lot of stress on the muscles in the back and the shoulders. So I like to get a good, um, good release through the shoulders and neck and really helps people feeling a lot lighter when they leave their treatment and um, yeah, a bit of bit, bit refocus going forward for the rest of the day. So uh, what would be the difference then between, say, if people were in the workplace, uh, can they be on a table or is it better in a chair? What's the recommended way? Sure. So. Two ways you can go about workplace massage. Obviously, uh, the table massage is a bit longer, drawn out sort of treatment, but the seated massage is something a lot of places go for, especially in a corporate environment. It's a lot more accessible to have more people come through that in the time frame. Um, so seated massage certainly has its benefits as well. Um, gives people the opportunity to get away from their workspace and turn, o turn their brain off for a little bit. Um, it's still got the element of human touch, which goes towards some relaxation and obviously all that together goes towards a mental refresh and um, mm. it's either way massage is can be an uplifting experience for somebody and uh, certainly something people look forward to 
when they're off to work that day to have that supplied for them. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. And why would you encourage people to take on corporate massage or any any sort of massage really, isn't it? Sure, uh, yeah. yeah. What would be the difference between corporate and other massage, for instance? So corporate massage, uh, a lot of people are involved in a high stress, high pressure environment. So it's good for to encourage people to get away from their workspace for a, even if it's a brief period of time in the day and help them refocus as well as having some some de-stress and physical change in their body. Um, it's not just for corporate environment. A lot of people on the tools and these sorts of things, they can develop muscle tension as mm. well as stress. So massage certainly works in any situation, um, whether it be in the office, people on the computer desk or on the tools. Uh, do you have a tip for anyone out there who, for instance, about massage or the, what would be your absolute top tip, for instance? Uh, for massage, I would say have it. Um, if you don't have access to it, try and do that. It's a major component for people's physical well-being, um, but you can't underestimate how much a good, strong treatment can contribute to a positive mindset for an individual. And if a lot of people in the one workplace can access that, uh, it certainly contributes to a happy work environment. And for more information on John or Corporate Massage, please go to our website. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week here on Health, Wellbeing and Lifestyle. Thank you.